should have. Okay, today we're happy to have uh, Marcus come tell us about anomaly that was not meant to be. Let's take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation to all the organizers. Um, today I will present part of my recent work um, together with, uh, so it was done together with Aaron de Bray, who is a postdoc now at Purdue, a mathematician, uh, Jonathan Heckman at UPenn and Miguel Montero in Harvard. And uh, so what I tell you about today is mainly focused on, on this paper here, published on the archive earlier this year. But I will also have something to say about uh, follow-up that will appear soon. And it's, uh, it's also related to some earlier work that I did together with Jonathan. So please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions and I'll I'll try to answer them. Okay, so the title of my talk is The Anomaly That Was Not Meant To Be. So what do I mean with that? Well, I want to answer the following question today, namely, is the duality of type to be anomalous? And anomalous means, is it broken by quantum corrections? And of course, you would probably start saying, of course, it cannot be because uh, we know that F theory really needs this uh, duality to be preserved and uh, a lot of other reasons, but uh, uh, let's keep our mind open and let's analyze the problem. So first, what is an anomaly? Well, in order to see if your system or your symmetry has an anomaly, you usually do the following thing. You couple your symmetry, it can be discrete or continuous, you couple it to a background connection that I call A. Then you take a path in configuration space so you vary basically your connection. You can also vary the, the metric of your space-time manifold if you want um, from A um, along a path to another point A, uh, a G that is just uh, connected via gauge transformation to the starting point. And then you calculate the partition function at both these gauge equivalent points. And if the partition functions don't match, then you would say that the symmetry has an anomaly. Okay, but now we can actually realize that if the beginning and the starting point are just connected via gauge transformation, we can just glue them together and we have a closed path. And if this closed path cor uh, corresponds to small variations in the sense that it's contractible in, in the configuration space, then the anomaly that uh, is associated to that would be a perturbative anomaly. However, these small variations, of course, are only possible. So these are really infinitesimal transformations in a sense. These are only possible if your uh, symmetry is continuous. So the duality group of type to be string theory is discrete. So actually it's free of perturbative anomalies. But in case uh, you find these perturbative anomalies, there is a lot of machinery that you can apply and becomes uh, very nicely expressed in terms of quantities like the anomaly polynomial, uh, that you can express in, in, in terms of a field strength, for instance, it can be calculated via one loop amplitudes. For example, in four dimensions, of course, it's associated to these triangle diagrams. Okay, but uh, so now let's think about what we did. We started with a configuration and we took a path in configuration space. So let's think about it in a more geometric way. So let's really geometrize what we're doing. So we set out our space-time manifold with our background connection on one side. So this is just given by A and M is just the space-time manifold. And then we start varying in configuration space along one uh, directions essentially. So we go from A to AG. Possibly there can also be diffeomorphisms on this side for the space-time manifold. And we end up with a gauge equivalent configuration AG and M here. Okay, this is essentially nothing else but what I showed you before, but in a sort of more geometric way. Now, I told you about small uh, paths in configuration space. You can do also a uh, large variation, meaning that the, the, the closed loops, so again, I can in principle glue this side back to that side up to a gauge transformation, and they can be non-contractible paths. And these correspond to, to global or Witten anomalies. 
And you see sort of that in a very natural way by geometrizing this path in configuration space, uh, you span a D plus one dimensional manifold. And indeed, if you, if you then do the gluing process I described, so if you glue this side back to that side up to this gauge transformation, you end up with a geometric construction that was used in, in Witten's paper in 82, where he analyzed exactly this global type of anomalies. And this construction is, is called a so-called mapping torus. Now, however, for, for us today, this will not be enough. So we have to generalize a, a step further by up, also not only allowing for this variation or paths in configuration space, but at the same time, we allow for topology changes in, in our space-time manifold. So for example, again, we set up our starting point. It's a theory on a space-time manifold M with background connection A. And now we allow, for example, this circle to split into two circles and going back to, to, uh, to one circle. So this would be really a topology change of the space-time manifolds from the left to the right, okay? And if you hear topology change, this should already sort of associate these kind of anomalies to quantum gravity, because once we make um, gravity dynamical, we really uh, believe that there will be fluctuations, at least at the smallest uh, uh, length scales, that also have a certain topology changes associated to them. So these sort of anomalies are natural to consider in a, in a quantum theory of gravity, and therefore, of course, also for a type to be string theory. And once more, you span naturally, and now this D plus one dimensional manifold, this, this, that can now be a little bit more interesting because it can, be, can have sort of more topologically non-trivial features like these holes in this one dimensional example. And uh, in the following, we really demand the absence of these type of generalized anomalies that were uh, called die-free anomalies, for example, in this paper. Okay, so uh, how do we detect this anomaly? The, the machinery that we use here is that of uh, anomaly field theory. So what is the anomaly field theory? Well, it's a D plus one dimensional uh, field theory and it's an invertible field theory. So it lives naturally on this sort of geometrized D plus one dimensional manifold and it has the following properties. So our original theory we're interested in living in D dimensions, we can, uh, we can calculate the partition function on any space-time manifold M with background connection A. And the result will be the same if we evaluate this anomaly field theory or at least E to the two pi I times the anomaly field theory on a D plus one dimensional manifold, such that the boundary is, is, is M, okay? And in order to do so, so that, that A, this curly A knows about all the physical data of our theory that we're interested in, we need to extend sort of from the D dimensional manifold into this D plus one dimensional manifold X, all the physical data that can be orientation, can be spin structures, gauge fields, and so on and so forth. And then the formulation of the absence of these generalized type free anomalies that contain also these topology changes is equivalent in saying that uh, the formulation is independent of how we extend our space-time manifold M into this D plus one dimensional bulk X. And then you can do something that is very useful in physics. So if you have two quantities uh, that should be the same. You can just two, uh, take two uh, different copies of it. You flip one, the orientation of one, and then you glue them along the common boundary here, right? And then if the two phases are uh, equal and opposite, so uh, uh, equal, uh, uh, sorry, they are generating opposite phases, this tells you that uh, you have no die fried anomalies if e to the two pi i times the anomaly field theory on every closed manifold with a gi given physical structure that we're interested in um, is evaluated to one, okay? And now, of course, the problem sort of is translated into finding um, this d plus one dimensional manifolds with a given physical structure. And we, uh, as usual in anomalies, we allow for continuous deformations that preserve this structure. And luckily there is a mathematical framework for that and it's exactly that of, of bordism groups. So bordism groups 
basically classify uh, the the uh, uh, d plus one dimension manifolds with a given structure up to continuous deformations that preserve that structure. So, so this is the recipe. So let's let's try to 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 build up the strategy for finding whether the duality of type two b is anomaly or uh, anomalous or not. So step one is, of course, we need to find the correct Bordison group that is that is related to the problem. So this will be denoted by omega 11 type 2b duality. And then there is one sort of simple solution. Uh, so if this group is trivial, we're done, because then we know that it evaluates trivially, the anomaly field theory evaluates trivially to one, and there cannot be any sort of anomaly associated to that. If this group is not anomalous, then we have to find a all the generators for this. So this is a, is a, is a billion group and we can find uh, uh, the generators. Then we have to determine the anomaly theory. So the, this 11 dimensional theory that evaluated basically tells us about the duality anomalies of type to be string theory. And uh, we have to specify that. And in the last step, we really have to evaluate this anomaly field theory on all different generators of our borders and group and make sure that it's one. If it's one, then there is no anomaly and we're happy. Is there, are there any questions maybe to that strategy that will now follow? Okay. So let me move on with the first question, namely what is the duality group of type 2b? And the first answer would probably be, well, it's SL to Z. However, that's not the full story. First, because there are fermions and these fermions transform under the duality group. And as for the tangent bundle uh, or for rotations, if the fermions uh, are transforming under symmetry, you usually have to associate like a double cover. The same is true here. So instead of SL to Z, we have to extend to a non-trivial double cover, which is also called the metaplectic group. Okay. But at the same time, there's another symmetry that we can include, which is the orientation reversal of the string world sheet. And this extends SL to Z, containing now a sort of reflection symmetry that has a determinant of minus one to GL to Z. But of course, the real answer is really the combination of the two. So you also have to do the spin uh, cover of, of this GL to Z and what you end up with. So there are two possibilities that are correlated essentially to either pin plus or pin minus structure. And it turns out that the correct possibility is the GL plus to Z. So that's the double cover of GL to Z, or it's basically MP to Z, uh, um, um, including this uh, orientation reversal of the world sheet. Now let's let's have a look at SL to Z first. So we know that it's generated by S and T, um, but for our purposes, it's 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 easier or it's more useful to actually generate it via S and U, which is a combination of T and S. Okay. Why is that uh, uh, nice for our purposes? Well, S actually generates a subgroup, which is a Z4, and U generates a subgroup that is a Z6. Okay. But S squared is the same as U to the three. So that forms what is known as an amalgamated product of SL to Z into these two uh, subgroups Z4 and, and, and Z6 that have this com uh, common Z2. And in the following, I will come back to like the Z4 part and the Z3 part of the, of the duality. And I will refer exactly to this, uh, to the part that is generated by S and the part that is generated by U. Now extending fermions, S to the four is no longer uh, the identity, but it's actually given by fermion number. And again, you can associate an amalgamated product, an amalgam, which is now twice as large. So you have a Z8 and a Z12 factor. And the same is true once you include this uh, orientation reversal of the world sheet. So you get an additional generator, which is a reflection sort of. And uh, now these groups split as an amalgam into a dihedral group of, uh, with a given number of elements. And finally, that is also true for GL plus. So this you can describe as an amalgamated product of D16 and D24. So with that, of course, we're interested in the, in the full answer. So the GL plus, 
um, we identified the correct bordism group. So type 2b is 10 dimensional. So the bordism group is in D plus one, i.e. Uh, 11 dimension. And the, the duality group is GL plus. However, I told you that the duality group contains fermion number, right? But this is also contained in the rotations of our space-time manifold. And that is what is known as a twisted tangen tangential structure. So sort of you twist the tangent bundle and the duality bundle into each other. And that is known for this group here is known as a spin GL plus structure. So what we're really interested in, in for our purpose is, uh, is the bordism group omega 11 spin GL plus of a point. Okay. And now of course the calculation of that is, is, is very hard. And what, what is very, uh, um, useful is exactly this amalgam structure of these groups that are involved. And then you can use like prime equivalences of, of certain parts in order to reduce it into easier pieces that you sort of uh, get a handle on. But still the techniques uh, are involved, for example, Atiyah Hirtzebrook or the Adam spectral sequence are quite involved. And for that, it's, it's great to have a fantastic uh, algebraic topologist in the collaboration that, that knows all the theorems that you need in order to figure it out. So that, that took us quite some time and uh, it, it, it's not easy to do that. But finally, the answer is that the Bordism group we're interested in is far from trivial. It has this 12 different summons and it's certainly not zero. So that this is not zero basically tells you that there's a lot of potential anomalies in the duality group of type 2b. So, of course, I didn't show you any of the details here. I just flashed the result. I, I do the same thing with the generators. Unfortunately, for the generators, there is no real sort of description of a recipe that always works in order to generate all the manifolds. Um, so there is a lot of educated guesswork with some hints coming from, for example, eta invariants that will come to come back to later and cohomology classes in terms of the, of the uh, tangent bundle as well as the, the duality bundle. Um, again, I give you just the, the, the final result, which took us a very long time to figure out. So uh, for all of the factors, we have one generator. And for example, the Z27 is generated by 11 dimensional length space. So this is S11 divided by Z3 with, with a duality bundle inside the Z3 part of the amalgam. Okay. And then there is some, some other usual suspects. So you have a lot of length spaces. You have some real projective spaces with some duality bundle on top. And then there is more, more exotic things like this Q411, for example, is a uh, vibration of a lens space over a two sphere that is, that is twisted in a certain way uh, and also appears in other contexts um, uh, in, in borders so and theory. They, these spaces come yeah. with a GL2 plus bundle on top of them? That's right, yeah. Every, every one of them has a, a, a GL plus bundle on top of them, right? And the difference, so why is there this dashed line here? The difference is that these four, first four generators, they don't involve the reflection of the GL plus. So basically those are still spin MP2 classes that just lift to spin GL plus classes. Whereas these generators in the bottom here, they, they need this reflection operator to, to, to be in there. So these are really honest uh, spin GL plus manifolds that do not have an analog for spin MP2. Okay. And then actually these last two, these X11, or we call them Arcana, uh, uh, Arcanum 11, uh, they took us a long time. And what they essentially are is, uh, is this real projective spaces fibered over other real projective spaces in a, in, in a certain way. So now this ticks the second, the second uh, item on the list. We now found all the generators. So now the third piece is the anomaly theory. So let's, let's look at the fields that can in principle contribute to the anomaly, uh, namely the fields of type 2b. Well, we have the axiodilaton, we have the two two-form fields, we have the self-dual four-form field, and we have the dilatinos and the gravitinos. 
Well, the, the axiodilaton and the two two-form fields are actually unproblematic since they, they sort of have a regulator that preserves SO2Z. So that's the, the analog of a mass term, if you wish, for anomalies, say. Then we have the fermions. They transform under the duality group and they're chiral. So that is sort of already all the hints you need in order to expect that those probably contribute to a, to a potential anomaly. And indeed, that is correct. And usually how fermions contribute in this more general setting of anomalies is via so-called eta invariants. And you can understand eta invariants as sort of boundary contributions of certain uh, index theorems. And we'll come to that in, in, a, in a second. And finally, you have this self-dual field or chiral four-form field C4. So chiral already tells you that you should be careful, but does it transform under the duality group? Well, it does under reflections, so it flips sign. And indeed, you find that uh, the chiral four form, you also have to take into account that it will contribute to the anomaly. But, but how this is done is actually more subtle. And again, I just flesh you the result. And of course, we build on an early, very important earlier work for that. Um, and uh, I split it into two parts. So the first part is, is, is the eta invariance. That is the fermion part. And this uh, sub-index here sort of tells you the, the effective charge under the duality group. And this uh, superscript RS tells you that it's the spin three half contribution and D is Dirac is a spin one half contribution. So this takes care of gravitinos and gilatinos. But then you're, you're left over with the four form field. This has sort of a perturbative, like a fluctuation piece, which is related to the Hirzebruch index in a sense, which is given by this uh, uh, eta invariant, the signature eta invariant. And this minus denotes that C4 flips sign under the reflection symmetry. And then there is a, a piece that is associated to topologically non-trivial configurations which needs the definition uh, which of a quadratic refinement. So these uh, self-dual p-form fields, if you want a, a well-defined action, often they require you to define a quadratic refinement. The same is, the same is true here. And this quadratic refinement is, we're considering is on the level of differential cohomology. So it's a bilinear pairing in differential cohomology, cohomology that I denote by Q tilde here and also contributes to the anomaly. Now there is one additional contribution, which is if your four-form field, C4, couples to other fields in your, in your theory, then there might be this additional piece, this Q uh, uh, coupling to C brief, where C brief denotes sort of the background of the other fields. And we know that such a coupling does exist in type 2D because we have this John Simons interaction between C4 and F3 and H3. However, in our, in our approach or in, 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 in our setup, we will uh, switch off F3 and H3. So this term will be zero in our case. And we're, uh, uh, we, we're left with the first uh, piece of this anomaly uh, theory. Now, one physical assumption that enters here, and I come back at the very end of my talk, is that we assume as a sort of a physical assumption that there is a canonical choice of two to choose this quadratic refinement for a general spin GL plus manifold. Okay. And then, the, then you use exactly this canonical choice in order to evaluate your anomaly field theory. Could I ask a few questions here? So uh, there, there's an issue here of which differential cohomology theory you're using to quantize the uh, self-dual forms. So the two obvious possibilities are differential K theory and differential um, um, singular cohomology. Um, the, uh, I think the anomaly might depend on that. That was I one agree. issue. And, I agree. And the so, other is what, this idea that you want to drop, just drop this Q tilde coupling. Is your, is your I thought that F3 equals H3 equals zero is a duality invariant statement. So if there's a duality anomaly there, then there's a duality anomaly in the theory. So, so let me, let me the idea, the first question. I, just, I mean, you know, 
with anomalies, it, it sounds a little dangerous just to ignore a coupling. So, so let me let me so try to understand what's the what's the rationale for just uh, ignoring. Let me, let me let me try to answer your first question. Indeed, uh, in principle, there is a a sort of refinement of what we're doing, since we know that the Ramo-Ramo fields are better classified by by K theory or differential K theory. Then you would need an honest uh, quadratic refinement on differential K theory. However, we did not simply have the technology in order to include those effects, so we we took the more basic approach of differential cohomology. However, there would still be a map, right, from differential K-theory to differential cohomology, which I agree, if you have differential K-theory, that there might be more subtle effects included that we will not see here, but the effects we will see here are certainly also included in the differential K-theory. And then uh, for the second part, I. 100% agree that once you include these fields, and of course, F3 transforms into H3 on the SL2Z, this will be a very interesting additional problem. For example, there can be like mixed anomalies between the duality uh, of type 2B and, for example, higher form symmetries in, that affect those fields here. But once more, we, we only consider not every anomaly, but just a subclass, namely the the pure duality anomaly and the duality gravitational anomaly, in a sense, at the level of differential cohomology. Okay. So let's do the evaluation. And remember, so there is uh, no anomaly. Uh, Marcus, which which yeah. high form symmetry are you talking about? As acting on F uh, I'll, I'll, So so in principle, you can ask the question if you have this coupling activated and consider it. Then I can do a, uh, a uh, so this B form has a, has a, a, a higher form, two, uh, the B2 has a two form symmetry. But it's a gauge symmetry. The, yeah, yeah. So you probably don't want those, or is that going to become some enhancing other ways? Um, well, the, the, the two form field B2 and C2 have a general, uh, 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 two form symmetries that, of course, are broken because they couple to, to physical objects like strings. But in principle, uh, as was also mentioned before, there can be an interaction of exactly this kind of coupling and the duality. And once you include more backgrounds, there might be more subtle effects concerning precisely that. May I, I come back in the very end in, in, my, in my outlook, and then uh, if you're not satisfied, you can maybe ask again, we can discuss it. Okay, thanks. So remember, um, the anomaly is absent if uh, the anomaly theory uh, curly A evaluated on our generators is zero mod an integer. Now for these classes, so these are all, these are a large subset of the spin uh, GL plus manifolds. We can do that and we find that indeed it's zero. Perfect, anomaly is gone. Now we have our special friend, the Arcanum 11. We can again try to evaluate it, but we were not able to do so because of the quadratic refinement in order to define it on this. It's, it's a bit complicated, but let's just forget about those cases. Those are just phases, the C2 phases. So let's say it's okay and focus on the part that we can, uh, even though we might be a little bit concerned, let's focus on the part that we can calculate. Well, these well, are sorry, the, we, the previous claim. So, did, did you actually evaluate the eta invariance and so on? Yes. You could do In that case, for yes. length spaces. And, oh, and what about That's the right. other term? Like, oh, you're ignoring the Q tilde? And, As, and so, the in this arc? case, there is an argument. No, in this case, there is an argument how to treat the Q tilde. And uh, basically, there's a trick to get, a, to get away with uh, uh, not being forced to evaluate it. However, this trick does not work for the arcane, so we couldn't apply it here. And the same is true for, so for spin manifolds, the, the good thing is that you can actually just switch off your duality bundle because it's spin, right? You don't need the twist in the duality bundle. And you know that there just the gravitational anomaly of type 2B vanishes, and you can subtract the two from each other. And then you get rid of, of uh, in the spin MP2 cases, you get rid of the quadratic refinement part because that only changes sign on the, on the reflections. That's sort of the strategy we used. However, again, for Arcanum 11, this doesn't work. 
Okay, so now the last class, these are the spin MP2, we can evaluate and we find they're not vanishing. So there is a duality anomaly uh, in, in type 2B as we know. So what is going on? And that brings me to the second part of my talk, meant to be the anomaly that was not. Okay. So of course, when we encounter an anomaly in, in, in string theory, we shouldn't panic right away, but instead we uh, should try to cancel it. I think just for the heterotic string, there is a gauge anomaly, but we can cancel it with a green Schwartz matrix. And actually to do so, we remember that there was this additional term in the anomaly polynomial, uh, sorry, in the anomaly field theory, namely, uh, sorry, there should be a tilde here, this Q tilde of a background field C brief that in principle can help us now. And how could that be? Well, if we find the C brief in terms of Bordism invariance, such that this contribution here cancels all the rest of the contributions that generated the anomaly on the previous slide, then we're fine, then the anomaly is canceled. So what kind of classes are candidates for, for, this, uh, for this differential cohomology class? Well, it's the characteristic classes of the space-time manifold and the characteristic classes of the duality bundle. And now sort of comes back this splitting in the am amalgamated product into this C3 part and C4 part. And you can encode your duality bundle into these pieces. So this is a degree one, this is a degree two. This is the Bockstein of, of that, if, uh, if you know what that, that is. And that is basically the building blocks for the duality part. And at the same time, we can take a mod N reduction um, of some characteristic classes of the manifold. So for example, Pontryagin classes, mod N, you can take Stiefel-Whitney classes um, uh, or more, more abstract object like the Pontryagin square of a, uh, of a, of a Stiefel-Whitney class. Now we can sort of construct all possible terms that can contribute to this C brief. And these are these four classes that make sense on general spin GL plus manifolds. So those are the ones that we can use in order to cancel the anomaly. And they contribute as follows. So this integer here gives you the N that contributes to, to, the, to the additional term induced by the quadratic refinement coupling to this background C brief. And A is the anomaly that we had in the, that, I, that I told you. So basically then the anomaly is canceled if this column matches because it had a minus one in front of the Q tilde, uh, matches this column once you plug this integer in here. And you see for the, for the 11 dimensional length space, you have one third and indeed there is a one here and zeros here. So you have one third, perfect, that works. For the other class- oh, sorry, I'm not understanding this. So, so for example, the box sign of A squared cup A that's mm -hmm. that's a, oh these are these are different uh, candidates for C brief. Is that the that's idea? Right. These are all degree five, if I'm yes computing that's right. correctly. So these are that's all right. degree degree five, and so that's these right. are these are things you could stick in for a C brief into Q tilde. That's 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 precisely correct. And how do you know what Q tilde is again? Sorry. So for these cases, it's, it's sort of uh, uh, natural. So for, for, for land spaces, you can calculate it. And luckily here, we only have land spaces. Once more for one generator where we had this land space vibration over the sphere, which is not spin, uh, we have to be more careful and we can calculate it for two times the copy, which once more is a land space and we know the quadratic refinement. So once we include these terms, we see that indeed all the calculable anomalies are canceled. But what does that mean for our type two theory? Well, there is now an additional coupling. So all the calculable anomalies that I showed you are canceled once we include the coupling of the four form fields to this now background uh, co uh, differential cohomology element generated by characteristic classes of the space time and the duality bond. And uh, this is the coupling. There is some prefactors that in principle uh, are not fixed. So this can be signs or integers mod four in this kappa case, but we have some heuristic arguments uh, in the connection uh, uh, connecting to essentially the effective deep brain charge of S folds that give a hint of what the correct choice is. 
But that really tells you that the anomaly is canceled once you include an additional coupling, which is, of course, very subtle because all of these are just mod n sort of torsion classes and non trivial duality bundles of your four form field. Now, there was already a miracle in type 2b supergravity that the anomaly is just such a way that all the different pieces fall into place to cancel. Do we find like a discrete version of this miracle, this miraculous cancellation uh, here? Well, let us focus on the biggest factor, which is the C27 generated by our 11 dimensional length space. So the quadratic refinement is given by one third n squared. So whatever integer you plug in here, the result will always be one third. Now, this can only cancel an, an anomaly that is one third, and this is precisely the anomaly we find for this length space. So, but in principle, there is no reason why the anomaly, which is a C27 class, is given by one third. It could be just any integer divided by 27. So, in a sense, uh, there is a chance one in 26, zero is out, because if you find zero, then you don't have an anomaly in the first place. But out of the 26 anomalous possibilities, for the evaluation of the anomaly field theory on this length space, this is the only one that can be canceled by this mechanism. Right? So there's a chance one in 26 that this works and similar for the other cases. So sort of there is a discrete way, a, a discrete miraculous cancellation at work here. Now Sorry, I come... a quadratic refinement, if you're defining a quadratic refinement of a given bilinear form, um, then you don't know it up to a, a linear and constant term. Wouldn't that change what you're saying? In other words, you could choose, you, you could shift Q tilde by something linear in N and constant in N, and it would still be a quadratic refinement. It could be that there is already like a, a canonical choice here, which is the canonical choice. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, so in this paper here, they give you a canonical choice of the quadratic refinement that works for spin manifolds. And this is sort of the canonical choice we, we take here. However, as I already told you, not all of our generators are really spin manifolds, so we have to be careful. But the ones that are problematic and we can calculate, namely these four are, and that's the canonical choice of quadratic refinement discussed in that paper that, that enters here. So now let's move to the third part of my talk, which is the anomaly meant there was no type to be, which is, well, are there alternative anomaly cancellations? I just presented you one, which sort of seemed funny because it just feels right because it matches exactly what you find. But is, is there different possibilities? Indeed, yes, there is. And these are related to, to what is known as topological green Schwartz mechanism that was discussed in this paper here. So what do we want? We want the phase in our partition function to vanish, but we do not, of course, want to do that by including new, new local degrees of freedom. But we're OK sort of with adding like a topological sector to our theory, That's something that doesn't change the local degrees of freedom. But then we can add a theory, let's call it Xi, that has an anomaly field theory that is precisely the one of type 2b with a minus sign. And of course, I can just add it to type 2b, and the whole thing will be invariant on the duality. One natural candidate for these kind of topological theories you can use is a higher dimensional generalization of BF theories. So BF theories is essentially you take a D minus P form and a P minus one form, and you couple them in such a Chern Simons like fashion to each other without kinetic terms. So there's no, no local, local, local excitation. Okay, but now since you include this new higher form field, they have a, a general uh, higher form symmetry, right? So if you have a P minus one form symmetry, uh, you can couple that to, a, to a, sorry, this is a P minus one form symmetry that you can couple to a background connection, which now is a P form field. And you have a D minus P form symmetry for the B part that you can couple to uh, D minus P plus one background connection. Right? Then the associated- Greg has, uh, Greg has another yes. question in the chat. 
Well, the no, I'm, I'm, I'm lost. Uh, a sub psi is an eleven-dimensional theory or a ten-dimensional? No, theory? no. Sorry, sorry. This is an eleven. Uh, sorry, this is a ten-dimensional theory, and this is the eleven-dimensional anomaly field theory associated to that. That guy. I see. Okay, got it. Okay, so this will give you a phase, right? This is precisely what you need. And now you have to figure out the following. Can I choose? So can I can I associate these background fields for my higher form symmetries to the characteristic classes of my manifold and the duality bundle in such a way that the anomaly is canceled? Right? This gives you a relation of xp and yp minus d plus one to these characteristic classes we studied before. And indeed, you can do so. So once more, let's take a, let's focus on this Z27 factor generated by this 11 dimensional lens space. In fact, the anomaly field theory can be written as, as, a, as a cohomology class in terms of the duality bundle. And then all your, the, the full task that you have is just split that into two parts. So for example, I can now associate the, the, the background gauge fields for these high form symmetries with this characteristic class of X3 and Y8. But I also could take X2 and Y9. I could take X5, Y6. So there is a lot of different possibilities of how to cancel this anomaly, the Z27 factor, by including higher form fields, a topological theory in, of higher form fields in type 2B. So what does that mean? So that means there is now many possibilities. In principle, you can conserve your duality uh, in various different ways. So do we now find many UV completions of type 2B? Well, the theories still differ, even though they don't have different local degrees of freedom. Uh, the completeness hypothesis actually tells you that once you include these fields, they should couple to some objects. These are now extended objects because they're higher form fields in this uh, generalized uh, Wilson line fashion, if you want. And now that uh, XP and YQ sort of know of the duality bundle tells you that there are world volume degrees of freedom that transform under the duality. And of course, depending on how I choose my split here, so how I choose my P, uh, so my, my A and my B field, the degree of my A and my B field, I find different objects. So for X3, I would find like this topological string like excitations and seven brains. But for the other cases, I could find two brains in type 2B that would do the job. So in a sense, this mechanism, this topological green Schwartz mechanism really tells you that there would be or there could be new objects in your theory. Or at the same time, there might be, so once you evaluate the uh, uh, equation of motion for this for these higher form fields, there might be sort of consistency conditions uh, similar to tadpole cancellation conditions. Okay. So now we have two ways. We have this miraculous cancellation by quadratic refinement. We have this various different ways of canceling it via a topological green Schwartz mechanism. So what are our options here? Well, in principle, there are two possibilities. Either- I have a, I have a, I have a question. Yep. So, so, so you, your, your statement is that you want to give an origin of these new terms by, uh, by turning on some topological theory. But if I take this topological theory in 10 dimensions and I put it in a space with a boundary, like ADS5 times S5, for example, uh, this topological theory should, should imply boundary modes. And, right. and we know well, it, well it's, it's a topological it's the topological term so I think it's more like uh, it's not really um, local degrees of freedom in the bulk it's really more associated to like discrete degrees of freedom there they don't, they don't have to be discrete um, I mean the boundary mode could be just some free 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 fields of lower degree. That, that 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 appear. Uh, so if I if I were to I, study... are you saying that if I take these objects and let them end, for example, at the at the at the ADS boundary? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so they. So would do be... you do you understand? But but we know ADS CFT very well. We know what the free fields are already. Well, we know we know ADS so CFT are... very well for a type two B theory, right? But now I, I just told you that maybe there are more that we haven't discussed yet. I agree it, that it, it, it is this statement that if you reduce these terms themselves in, AD, in, in ADS five times S five, that they would actually vanish, so they don't give you any new new stuff. 
or uh, uh, well we, we haven't analyzed it so i cannot tell you anything uh, definitive here but uh, as i said they, they at least these versions of the anomaly cancellation would tell you that there are new objects that carry sort of some information about the duality bundle so if you would as you say let them end on the on the ads boundary it could very well be that they are associated to like sort of different cft domain walls or, or things like that uh, yeah. okay but also another place to look you can think about the conformal blocks that you would get by quantizing this theory and to think, also yeah. we know what they mean in the in the dual theory have you can you say anything? No, about no, we have, we have, we have not, we have not figured anything out about these, uh, about these alternative cancellations at the moment. Okay, so but it's one last point of confusion. But 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 we think we understand at least how things work quite well in the in the dual theory, and what the conformal black should be. So you shouldn't get something new from there, right? Or, or right. I mean, I mean that that. that so I'm not entirely sure if, if the argument is circular because you start with a fixed type to be theory, right? And then you, you, you look at the background that you know is consistent, so ADS five times S five, and then you do the calculations there. Now you could start with a, a new version, which is uh, the type to be that you knew coupled to this topological part. And you can now start to evaluate first is ADS five times S five with a uh, five form flux is it still a solution maybe it isn't then of course the the, the the analysis cannot be done there if it is then it probably corresponds to a different conformal field theory at the, at the boundary that has some discrete sort of distinction to to the standard story right so that, that is really an open question i would say okay good so my question is just that we do know what are the discrete choices at these for n equals four to be young males and, and we can characterize right. them so, so okay. Okay. all right, thank you. Um, so, so that's, that's I'd like to pursue uh, Ivo's question a little bit. He's asking about the um, the the singleton modes. These Wilson lines are they value are they continuously valued or are they valued in a finite group? They're a finite, finite group value. Finite group. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So um, that's precisely this slide. That's what this slide is about, right? So either we have now this weird different theories that might give it like a discrete landscape. So I'm not now talking really about a discrete landscape in 10 dimensional theory, not in lower dimensions, in 10 dimensions that differ by these topological uh, 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 couplings or these topo additional topological theories that are coupled to that. Or these can be in the swamp plan. I would be a little bit inclined to believe that simply because the, the quadratic refinement cancellation is so miraculous but we cannot be sure. So these are two possibilities. So sort of it's a 10D landscape of string theories versus a topological swamp land, if you want. So that, that really the screen Schwartz terms are somehow not allowed, but we don't know a reason a priori why. And maybe maybe this uh, uh, conformal field theory uh, viewpoint is, is, is a very good approach to, to, to see why these might not be allowed. And then of course, the, the picture that we drew here is like, you're, you're, once you take into account um, dualities, you sort of should see that these uh, different theories also uh, uh, propagate to, to your other string theories in 10 dimensions. And then instead of this M, M theory star, you really find rather a like an M theory flower. One additional thing is if it's consistent and you have now this different UV completion, and the corporatism conjecture tells you that there should be finite tension objects that that uh, that interpolate between the two different vacua. And then, of course, you can ask the question: What are those objects? What properties do they have? And so on. So, with that, let me come to the conclusion. So, I told you that we have uh, we have developed a, a couple of necessary tools, or used others that were developed before terms of like Bordism classes, eta invariants, in, in order to really nail down a certain uh, uh, realization of this duality anomaly of type 2b. And we found that the textbook version of type 2b is indeed anomalous. There's two ways to cancel it, either via this quadratic refinement, which is a very subtle modification of the action, or by adding these topological field theories in, in terms of this topological version of the Green-Schwartz mechanism. And this brought us to like a distinction between a discrete landscape and a topological swamp. 
So now let me come to back to the, as promised to the quadratic refinement. Maybe this term, this coupling or this definition of C brief, this differential cohomology class is sort of what you need in order to define a, a canonical quadratic refinement for general spin shield bus manifolds. Then of course, in, in a sense, if that is true, you wouldn't really say there was an anomaly in the first place. There was just a piece of information about type 2B and the definition of its anomaly field theory that we were not aware of yet. So that is, that is sort of a disclaimer. Um, and that might be very well be true, but we couldn't figure out whether that, that is indeed the case. So with that, let me, let me come to the outlook. Well, we, we calculated omega 11. So what about uh, the lower classes? Uh, we calculated those as well. So in all different versions, so one, we have basically the bosonic part of type 2B and only the spin MP2 and then the full spin GL plus. Now the Bordism conjecture would tell us that all these Bordism classes should vanish because if they don't, they sort of generate a, a charge on the global symmetry in, in, in the, in the uh, 10 dimensional string theory, global symmetries, even if they are discrete, uh, should be forbidden in a full theory of quantum gravity, so better these groups vanish. So now let's take a, these groups as sort of approximation of the actual Bordism group of, of quantum gravity. And uh, I can tell you that many of them are non-zero. So there are basically now two options. First, there are objects, certain kind of, uh, of defects in my type 2B that are either known or not known, that kill those borders and classes. Okay. Um, and this would be a breaking uh, of the symmetry in a sense. On the other hand, maybe the classes that we find are just forbidden due to some tadpole cancellation conditions. So that these are now selection rule kind of arguments that, that would tell you that, that uh, you shouldn't uh, take type 2B and put it on a background of a certain type. And um, this is, of course, an exciting opportunity. And let's take the second, the, the first viewpoint I told you, the second bullet point I wrote down. So maybe there are new objects. And indeed, once we do that, we, we rediscover and discover uh, some new background for type 2B. So uh, just, uh, 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 I, I didn't mention it here, but what appears very naturally, for example, are these S-fold backgrounds that you sort of need in order to kill uh, uh, Bordism classes. Uh, but of course, uh, once you go lower, it, it becomes less explored and there might be new surprises uh, that, will be, uh, uh, that will be classified in, in this upcoming paper here. And now finally, the last slide, of course, there is now many potential extensions. As I told you, there could be mixed anomalies. So the, the, this, uh, talk was simply about the duality, the pure duality anomalies and the duality gravitational mixed anomalies, but it didn't, didn't contain any of the other symmetries or gauge symmetries, for example, that you have in type 2B. So you could ask, once I include them, are there new forms of mixed anomalies? You can, you can use the same machinery for other type of anomalies as was done uh, in this paper for the SL2Z of Maxwell theory, for instance. You can ask, like, does this have influenced this classification uh, for certain uh, condensed matter applications? And of course, as, as was already mentioned, uh, uh, the honest to God approach would be to really take K theory for your Ramor Ramor fields. And uh, uh, we were not able to do so, but this would be an extension and might lead to a finer classification of the, of the potential anomalies in the system. Thank you very much. Okay, let's thank Marcus. Uh, we can take a couple of questions. Um, we have some time. Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, I, I have lots and lots and lots of questions, but one of them is that if I take 2B on a, on a circle bundle, that should be dual to M theory. And then the SL2Z gets geometrized into the mapping class group of the torus bundle in M3. Right. Uh, so are you saying that there's a gravitational anomaly? So the problem here is, is there that for the type, 
for the type 2b theory that we studied here, it's very essential that you keep the, the torus in the geometry, right? Once you go to M theory, there is no way, no uh, restriction to just get away, uh, to, to, to just forget about the torus, deform your manifold with something that doesn't have a torus inside and then go back to a, to elliptic fibration. I didn't understand that at all. I mean, I, I could put M theory on a torus fibration and I think the translation of what you're saying in the M theory case is that there's a, um, what I'm saying is that some kind of gravitational is, anomaly on torus bundles. What I'm saying is that the bordism classes for M theory are not given by uh, by by spin GL plus manifolds, but would be given if if you ask uh, uh, I think the Fried Hopkins by this uh, 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 MC manifolds. So these are really the the the, the, the manifolds where M theory makes sense. For. What I said is what we did is we, we sort of took a GL, uh, let's, let's do it for MP2Z there, it becomes a little bit more apparent because you can really associate it to elliptic vibration and then the, the, the MP2Z sort of acts on the, on the torus fiber of F theory, including the spin structure. But then it's very important for us in our type to be setup that you still, you always have this torus fiber. And of course, this would, would be associated to something in M theory that always has this torus fiber. But the uh, honest bordism group of M theory wouldn't require this torus fiber. So you can do deformations that just destroys the torus and, uh, and, and gets back to the elliptic vibration on the other hand. I'm still not getting it. I mean, we, have a, we, we can talk about M theory on various uh, backgrounds and ask if there's a diffeomorphism anomaly. So maybe let me try and rephrase your question to see if I understand your answer. To see if I understand. So, are you saying that the the um, the manifolds on which your anomaly is non-zero uh, do not admit um, circle vibrations? That sounds a little unlikely, since there were lots of lens spaces and so, so on. So, what I'm saying is that if you uh, if you go to M theory and want to see whether there are gravitational anomalies, you should go to the corresponding bordism uh, classes that account for all the deformations that you allow in M theory to happen, right? But these deformations do not preserve the torus. So sort of the, 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 the anomalies that we find in type 2b will not translate into gravitational anomalies. They might translate into something else of, of a torus so what, what might happen is if you restrict your M theory to, to elliptic vibration, uh, there might be some sort of subtle anomalies in the, in the lower dimensional theory associated to the elliptic vibration. But it's not, it's not an 11D gravitational anomaly of M theory. All right, so let me ask a related question. So um, if you properly formulate the, um, the cubic term uh, for the C field in M theory uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that makes sense in a global, yes. globally well-defined way in terms of shifted differential cohomology of degree four, right. then rather non-trivially on circle bundles, um, that rep reproduces the relevant quadratic and um, refinement of differential K theory in type two. Right. So yes, I agree. Uh, so, so you know, so could one test whether your proposed topological terms are compatible with the standard eleven-dimensional uh, supergravity? Yeah, so that is something we thought about, and I think you can. I don't think it's a one-to-one -one relation. So not all of the classes that we find in top type two B are uh, uh, probably related to this. Uh, so the naive thing you would do is you would compare it to uh, to this MC structure, man the bordisms of the MC structure manifolds, and there we didn't find a match. But I believe that that what you said is correct. So we could now really take M theory on a circle vibration and try to find these uh, type to be, uh, or at least evidence for the coupling that we wrote down in order to cancel the anomaly on the M theory on the M theory part, and that would be very very interesting. But we didn't do so. I mean, okay, even, but before that, even before, before that, 
even before that, there's the 2A, 2B duality. Uh, you, you should ask, what does this mean for 2A theory in 10 dimensions, if possible? 100%, yes, I agree. I mean, these are, these are all things that are basically on, on our list, but uh, we have no definite answer to what this corresponds to and whether you can find this as generalized like tadpole uh, conditions, for example, in type 2a or uh, these consistency conditions for, uh, for this shifted differential cohomology elements in M-theory. And yeah, I, I, I would think that they are likely, uh, they have to be related, but the precise relation we, we have not figured out yet. Have more questions? Just unmute yourself. Okay, if there aren't any more questions, let's thank Marcus one more time. We can turn off the recording. There'll be free discussion.